Welcome to my CompTIA Security Plus Lecture Review. Uh, here we're working with the book Network Security Fundamentals, 5th edition. This video is dealing with Chapter 3, the application and network-based attacks. So that's always a fun one, because we're talking about more application and network uh, originating attacks. And that's actually a lot more than people realize. Objective, they're going to listen and explain the different types of server-side web application attacks, define client-side attacks, explain how overflow attacks work, and list the different types of network-based attacks. may not seem like a whole lot, but this is actually a lot of material that we got to dive pretty deep in. So application attacks are attacks on applications typically in a networked system uh, or a network environment and it can be directed towards the server the client or both here if you look at application data you can see that will be tied to the network either the client or server and on top of that will set an operating system and then on top of the operating system will be the application and data server-side web application attacks target the server uh, portion that will be hosting the websites. So it's paramount we start talking about securing server-side web apps uh, because this is more important than people realize. A lot of these web applications uh, aren't really uh, difficult to protect them, but a lot of people just don't do it. Traditional network security devices can block traditional network attacks but it's really hard for them to block or stop web application attacks because you don't know what's valid and what's not valid. Again, a lot of HTTP and HTTPS traffic is ignored because they're not looking in the packets specifically. We've already talked about a zero-day attack before, but we'll talk about it again. A zero-day attack is an attack that exploits a previously unknown vulnerability so that the victim have no time to prepare or defend against the attack because they didn't even know that was a vulnerability. Next is server-side web application attacks. We're going to go a little bit more further into the types of attacks. Things like cross-site scripting, SQL injections, XML injections, and command injections or directory transversal. So an SQL injection is where you inject SQL commands. XML injection, same thing. Uh, Cross-site cross scripting is a pretty common attack. And that is, it typically refers to a client-side code injection where the attacker can execute malicious scripts, sometimes called malicious payloads, well the scripts would be the payload, into a legitimate web server or web apps uh, application without it realizing what it's doing. Cross-site scripting could be things like search terms or uh, things like that. You can manipulate the variables depending on the code uh, that you're using. Again, it injects scripts in the web application to direct attacks at unsuspected clients when there is no like form validation there. When the victim visits the injected website, the malicious instructions are sent to the victim's browser. And typically this is the still information because you can go back and forth. You can target the client or target the server. And this is retained by the browser when visiting specific sites. A uh, cross-site scripting attacker does require a website meet two criteria. That is user's input in a response, and it will accept user input without validating it. Hence why the new standards require validation of input. When it says email address, it outlines the structure of the email address, thus forcing it to validate that it's a valid email. Maybe not like a valid email being able to be received, but it'll be something like alias at domain dot some extension and it's looking for that standard instead of select star from table semicolon. Uh, 
Here's an example of uh, cross-site scripting. When you look at things like Abby, it will actually look at names and it will try to hijack those names. What I was describing earlier, the select star from table, that's more of an SQL injection. And this will target SQL servers specifically by injecting malicious commands into them. Again, SQL being a structured query language, and it's used to manipulate a relationship database where you can actually uh, do things like forgotten password examples. The attacker enters the incorrect formatted email address, forcing the system to respond to it. The response will let the attacker know whether input is being validated or not. Because if you try to do a uh, validated email uh, input box and you don't put an email address there, you put some other string of code, then, you know, it'll be validated or not. Because it doesn't come back with a, you know, this is not a properly formatted email address, you know, obviously it's not being validated against a structure or predetermined structure. Uh, again, here is the SQL that you could do. This may result for all user email addresses being displayed. Uh, again, some of this is outdated material. A lot of SQL injections, if it's a patched SQL server, a lot of these are getting harder and harder to accomplish because these caused so much damage early on. These are all standards where they know that they have to fix them. So a lot of web designers and website um, admins know that they have to protect against this and they've already validated inputs in those areas. Here's an example, uh, other example of SQL injection statements. Whatever and email is null, it should determine the names of different fields of the databases. If it's allowed, um, full name like a user, whatever, uh, drop table members, erases the database table, and so forth. XML is a markup language, and this is a method for adding uh, annotation to text. Things like HTML, which uses tags to surrounded by brackets, instructs the browser to display text in specific formats. HTML, I think we're on version 5 right now. Where XML carries data instead of indicating how to display it. There are no predefined sets of tags. The user themselves define their own tags. So it makes it a little bit more flexible. This is similar to an SQL injection where the attacker will discover a website that doesn't filter user data and it can inject its own tags and data into the web application and or database. We have what's called an XPath injection. Specifically, it's a specific type of XML injection attack. And basically, it attempts to exploit XML path languages and path language queries that are built from users' input. Directory transversal or command injections. This is where the web server user, uh, users are typically restricted to the root directory. You don't get to browse any directory you can have access to specific directories not being able to change them, hence the transversal. That way you cannot inject commands at different folder types. Users may be able to access subdirectories but not parallel or higher level directories but again that's going to be dependent on the server security. Directory transversal attacks use a mal malformed input or will take advantage of software vulnerabilities to allow you to verify or to transverse uh, directories or to verify or to view data in those directories when you shouldn't have access to them. The attackers will move from a root directory to a restricted directory to see if they have access. A command injection attack is when the attacker enters commands to execute on a server. The directory transversal attack can be launched through a vulnerability, through a web application, vulnerability in the web server OS, or just because the security on the web server is not what it should be. Here's an example of a directory transversal.
Uh, normally, if we're talking IIS, everything is stored in the INET pub, which a subfolder of that would be the www root. And you can actually, from there, accidentally uh, gain higher level uh, privileges by being able to go into like the Windows folder, assuming it's an IIS server. That way, okay, you normally won't have access to the Windows folder from the web server. You can do damage that way. So it's not so much just transversal of directories of the website. It'll be transversal of the directories of the web server. Moving on, let's talk about some client-side application attacks. And this is where the web, app web application attacks are typically server-side. So the client-side attacks should target vulnerabilities in the client applications that interact with the compromised server and process the malicious data. The client will initiate the connection with the server typically, which could result in the attack or could result in the client being compromised. A good example could be what's called a drive-by download. And this is where the client computer is co compromised simply by viewing a web page. What ends up happening is the web page, when you visit it, may have scripts running in the background that then download them. Uh, that's one of the big reasons why Java is very heavily uh, becoming out of favor. I'm not saying anything bad about Java. I'm just saying there are certain websites that actually have been able, able to take advantage of Java's code so that they can inject their code into it. Attackers, will, again, will inject content into vulnerability, uh, vulnerable web servers and through that process gain access to servers' operating systems. Again, the attackers could craft a zero-pixel iframe to avoid visual detection. That way you don't see uh, the attacker gaining access. You can also embed an HTML document inside a main document so when the client's browser downloads uh, a file, it may also download malicious scripts. All of this deals with being able to instruct the computer to download malware. Uh, again, malware being any type of malicious code. Other type of client-side attacks are header manipulation. Being able to uh, manipulate the HTTP header. Again, this will contain fields that characterize data that's being transmitted. The header itself can originate from a web browser, though the browsers do not normally allow this. Some browsers do, especially if they're out of date, so that the uh, attacker's short program can allow modification. That's why the browsers don't typically allow it, but again, it kind of goes back to what browser and what version of the browser. Uh, the examples of the header manipulation could be things like referral, accept languages, or response spl uh, splitting. The response splitting actually is the response is coming from multiple locations. Alright, so let's explain these types of manipulations. Referral, oh, apparently I didn't want to go to the next slide, there we go. Referral uh, are fields that indicate the site that generated the web page. The attacker can modify this field to hide the fact that it came from another site. It's a way to be able to go site to site without you realizing it. So the attacker can modify this field, and it's pretty simple to do. The accept language field, it deals with content that can be passed directly to an SQL database. Acceptable language. The attacker could inject some SQL commands by modifying the header. And again, response splitting is one of the most common types of manipulation attacks. And it deals with being able to split the responses. Let's talk about different types of cookies. Cookies are a uh, user-specific uh, stored information on a local device. There are three types of main, main types of cookies. First party, third party, session. Also, persistent cookies. We'll talk about that here in a second. And sometimes uh, object cookies. First party cookies are cookies created by the website the user is currently viewing. Third party cookies are advertisement place cookies to record your preferences. 
Session cookies are stored in RAM and expire when the browser is closed. Persistent cookies record uh, a computer on a computer's hard drive and does not expire. These are also called tracking cookies. And again, shared objects can uh, be used to store information from a website. Normally up to 100 kilobits, kilo, yeah, kilobytes, not bits, but big B. They're more complex than a simple text found on a regular cookie. Sometimes they're called flash cookies, though it's not always a flash cookie because flash cookie can also mean something else, but that's a different conversation. So, cookies do pose a risk, both through security and privacy. First party cookies may be stolen and can be used to impersonate you. This is also called tailoring, and they can be exploited by attackers. Attachments files that are coupled with email messages, for example, can also be uh, manipulated and modified and used as a security uh, concern. Malicious attachments are common and are used to spread things like viruses, trojans, and additional malware content. We also have what's called a session hijack. And this is where the attacker attempts to impersonate users by stealing or guessing session tokens. The session token is a random string assigned to an inter interaction between a user and a web application, typically securely, but it can be compromised. An attacker can attempt to obtain this session token by cross scripting, by eavesdropping, or just by simply guessing or brute forcing it. Problem with that is this will allow the session to be hijacked. In ethical hacking, we actually showed a man in the middle that was doing session hijacking and rerouting or modifying any EXE downloads. That way it would actually redirect it to a Kali machine. It would then modify it before giving it back to the client download, thus being able to install malware on an EXE that they didn't realize was infected. Client side attacks. Here's an example of session token attacks or session hijacking attacks uh, where they're looking at the session token being vulnerable. Additional client side attacks could be anything like malicious add-ons, uh, plugins for example, or add-ons or extensions that may add, add functionality to a web browser could also be malicious. Add-ons can do the following, create uh, additional web browser toolbars, change browser menus, could change the way that the browser looks. Uh, it could also be aware of other tabs that are open. It can also process the content of every web page that is loaded. So again, some of these you got to be careful. Security risks exist when we add in add-ons. Malicious add-ons can be written using uh, even Microsoft ActiveX. ActiveX is a set of rules on how the application under uh, Windows OS should uh, share information. So a potential attacker can take advantage of the vulnerability in ActiveX and they can use this to create malicious attacks on a computer. Again, if you look at any browser, they're all out there uh, and they all have vulnerabilities. They all have security issues. It's a matter of spending the time to figure out which browser is correct for you. We also have an, what's called an impartial overflow attack and this is where the attack is designed to overflow areas of memory with instructions from the attacker where a impartial means they can target either a server or a client and normally these types of attacks fall into a few different categories arbitrary or remote integer or buffer overflow. Buffer overflow attacks occur when a process attempts to store data in RAM beyond the boundaries of the fixed length of that buffer. Extra data overflows into adjacent memory locations causing the system to behave uh, 
not correct. An attacker can overflow the buffer with a new address pointing to the attacker's malware code, thus forcing it to run that malware. Here's an example of the normal process and the instruction set and then the buffer overflow can actually show you the structure and how it could do this set up a new pointer to point towards the new malware. Integer overflow attacks is when an integer overflow is a condition that occurs when the result of a arithmetic operation exceeds the maximum size of the integer type. For example, if it's a single or a double, how large can it get? And the uh, integer overflow would be if it's a single and it's actually above the maximum number size that that single could be. Basically, an attacker will change the value of a variable to something outside the range, and this is intended by causing the overflow, because again, the programmer designed a specific range, and we're outside of that scope now. Lastly is that arbitrary or remote code execution. Basically, this is a heap spray is often used to, are used in arbitrary remote code executions, Basically, they insert data only in parts of memory, not all of memory. And this is so that the code execution attack allows the attacker to run a program and also execute commands on different computers. Not always on the same computer. So you can infect a web server and then actually get it to run the remote code on the clients that are connecting to it. And the purpose is so that you can gain control of victims by executing those commands. Alright, let's go and let's talk about some network-based attacks. Uh, big types of attacks here are going to be things like interception, poisoning, uh, access rights, denial of service. Uh, again, the big thing here is the attackers will place a higher priority on targeting the network itself instead of the client and or server. There are exploiting a single vulnerability may expose hundreds of thousands of devices to an attacker. So again, if you exploit the network instead of the actual individual servers, you may actually get a lot more bang for your buck. Denial of service or DOS, sometimes called a distributed denial of service, and that's when it's distributed, is a deliberate attempt to prevent uh, uh, authorized users from accessing a system by overwhelming it with requests. That's one. A distributed denial of service is when you have hundreds of systems actually flooding a device or a unit, a item, regardless of what it is, so that that item cannot respond. So for example, we could do a distributed denial of service where we get like 100 people and we all try logging into the same web server at once. 100 may not be large enough. We may have to do 200, 300, thousand but eventually we distribute enough people to target that one server or that one router or that one switch or whatever the item is so that it no longer is able to respond because so many people are requesting information from it common types of denial of service could be things like a ping flood attack and that's where you use just a basic icmp echo packet and the ping utility will just send mass amounts of those echo requests. In a ping flood attack, multiple computers rapidly send large numbers of ICMP echo requests to the server so that the server will drop legitimate connections and it should refuse new connections. And that's just a type of denial of service attack. A smurf attack is another common type of attack. And this is where it tricks devices into responding to false requests to an unsuspecting victim. Basically, the attacker will broadcast a ping request to all computers on the network, but change the address from which the request came from. That process is called spoofing. This will appear as if the victim computer is asking for responses from all computers on the network. All the computers that were on the network will then respond to that, causing that one unit to go down. All the computers sending a response to the victim computer so that the victim computer is overwhelmed and stops becoming available. We have other types of 
DOS attacks could be like a sync flood attack, and this takes advantage of the procedures for initiating a session. A three-way handshake, where they continually start the handshake, but they don't actually finish it. So in a sync flood attack against the web server, the attacker will send a sync segment, and it will keep sending them. That way the server keeps opening up these handshakes, but they never actually finish or conclude them. Here's an example. They'll have several attackers, or maybe one attacker, that will spoof its address, will send multiple sync requests, the server will respond with a sync ACK, and then it will actually go into a waiting state, waiting for the acknowledgement from those other computers. Those computers don't have to be real. They don't even have to have uh, real IP addresses. And thus, it opens up multiple sessions waiting for those fake or non-existing computers to actually respond so they can set up that session handshake. Another type is interception. This is typically a man-in-the-middle type attack. This is where you have a device that will actually intercept legitimate communications and may forge their own connection and or may respond to both the client and server. So we'll now have to pass traffic through it. Here's an example of it. You may have a victim and a server, they do a, a original connection, and then the attacker forms a new connection between them, so all the traffic will now go through the new connection. This is things like a replay attack, and this is where the attacker makes copy of the transmissions before it sends it to the original recipient uses a copy at a later time for whatever reason. Could be things like capturing logon credentials or capturing uh, password hashes. Other more sophisticated types of replay attacks are when you actually capture network traffic and uh, you later then send the original valid messages to the server. Basically this will establish a trust relationship between the attacker and the server. Poisoning is also a good one. This is the act of introducing a, su a substance that will harm or destroy. It could be where you uh, do ARP poisoning, and yeah, it's actually where you start poisoning the ARP responses. You could also poison DNS. The two major types are ARP and DNS poisoning. Basically, poison, it will go into a normal network process, and it will actually take advantage of how they function, and then they poison those functions, like DNS. It may, in, it, it may inject invalid DNS responses that aren't valid anymore. Here is the example of the attacker and the victims. Uh, notice the manipulation of the MAC address, MAC addresses and IP addresses. Looking at the ARP cache, because again, ARP is where they modify MAC addresses in the ARP cache. Purpose of all of this, stealing data, could be some type of DOS attack, or it could just be prevent, prevent internet access. Kind of just depends on the purpose. One of the big last ones is DNS poisoning. Because DNS, and it's its basic form converts names to IP addresses, or IP is the names. You can actually poison this by substituting DNS addresses that will redirect the computer to a different device. For example, you go to google.com. It looks up google.com in DNS, and then it responds to this is the IP address you have to go to for Google. Well, what happens when you manipulate that so the responding address is no longer Google, it takes you to a, a fake page that might be similar to Google. And then you don't think anything of it. You think, oh, well, it's Google. You type in your search query, and there you go. Two locations for DNS poisoning, that local host, uh, the, the host table, or the host file on the local computer, and the external DNS server. Here's the example of the poisoning. You can actually look at the three sites and they actually change the IP addresses to the attacker.
Attack on access rights are always a big one because access rights are how we secure data. So by manipulating privileges to access the hardware and software resources, you can actually grant or revoke access to the appropriate users. Two types of tax deal with access rights, privilege escalation, and transitive access. The privilege escalation is exploiting software vulnerabilities to gain higher level privileges. The purpose of this is to gain access to resources that you normally wouldn't be able to have access to. Two types of privilege escalation is when a lower privileged user accesses functions restricted to higher privileged users. For example, when you have a folder secured so that only admins can see it, yet a regular user can see it, that could be a form of privilege escalation. Or when a user with restricted privileges accesses different restricted functions of a similar user. That also could be a type of privilege escalation because they're not authorized to see those restricted functions or uh, view restricted folders or directories. Lastly is that transitive access. This is where an attacker involves a third party to gain access rights. Example, system one can access system two, but system two can access system three. So basically, system one can access system three. So you can target system one to gain access to system three. And that is this chapter in a nutshell. We talked about uh, cross-site scripting. We talked about client and server-side attacks. We talked about session hijacking, buffer overflows, poisoning, and analysis of service attacks. If you have any questions about any of the material for this chapter, please let me know. Thank you.